there was an article recently in the New York Times talking about the fact that most people in Thailand were getting less and less interested in Buddhism. And one of the monks he interviewed was saying that given the fact that everybody likes instant noodles, instant coffee, instant whatever, what we need is an instant Buddhism to get people back in, into the fold. Of course, that's the problem. Everybody wants instant Buddhism. A few short, easy slogans you can hold in mind. And something you can apply without thinking to your practice. In other words, we want a foolproof method. But the problem with a foolproof method is that you can master a foolproof method and still be a fool. And what the Buddha is offering instead is a method that's going to force you to develop your discernment. Because after all, the mind is very subtle. There are lots of things going on in the mind, and there are a lot of issues you're going to have to deal with as you bring the mind to concentration. In the beginning, you don't want to think about those issues too much. You want to focus on the breath. But you find that the issues are going to come in, and you've got to learn how to deal with them. So it's good to have a sense of what some of those issues are going to be, and how the instructions will change depending on the state of your mind. The first issue, of course, is the balance between focusing too heavily or too light. The Buddha compared it to holding a quail in your hands. If you hold it too loosely, the quail is going to fly away. If you hold it too tightly, it's going to die. So how much pressure do you apply to the breath right now so that it's just right? You stay with the breath, but you're not clamping down on it. And you try to say, <clears throat> stay with it smoothly. Try to make the breath like silk. Smooth all the way in, smooth all the way out. And that requires a certain steadiness of focus. And the question will come up, what's next? This is next. The next breath. And you do the same thing there, the same thing with the next one and the next one. But then you find there are other issues that come in. Are you feeling too sluggish or too scattered? Is your energy level too low or too high? You have to, you have to adjust that as well. The Buddha encourages you, when the mind is getting sluggish, to analyze what's going on. Okay, what here is skillful right now and what's unskillful? The fact that you are taking a proactive approach to asking those questions and trying to answer them should help stir up the juices a bit, get you interested in what's going on. This sluggishness, how do you feel it? Where do you feel it? Sometimes you notice there are a few stray sensations in the body that you very quickly label as signs that you are tired, <coughs> as signs that you're tired. But you have to believe that label. Maybe there's another part of your awareness that's not really tired at all. And try to depend on that to figure out what to do next. And this is where things get complex again. When the Buddha taught about suffering, he taught four noble truths. There wasn't just one truth. And the reason he chose four is because there are four duties that you have to follow as a meditator. Any stress or suffering in the mind is something you want to comprehend. And you can figure out what's causing it. When you see the cause, then you try to abandon it. Then there are other things that come up in the practice that are parts of the path. Those are things you want to develop. so that you can realize the cessation of suffering. So those are four different activities right there. And the development, 
development of discernment, of appropriate attention, is to figure out which of those duties do you need to follow right now, and with regard to what events in the mind. That's a translation of a Dharma talk by John Cha, in which the original translation said that we're focusing on the breath. Any thoughts that come up, you want to let go. And the Thai transcription of the talk was actually skewed to follow the English translation, or the English version. But we found out that when you actually listen to the talk, he was saying, if thoughts come up, if they're directed to the breath, if they're helpful in evaluating the breath, think them, because that gets you even more firmly involved with the breath. So that means that some thoughts are thoughts to be abandoned, and some thoughts are thoughts to be developed as part of the path. You've got to learn how to exercise your discernment there to figure out which is which. And then carry through with whatever the task is. If you see that something is unskillful, you try to keep it from arising. If it has arisen, you try to abandon it. That's what you do with the cause of suffering. As for the path, if it hasn't arisen yet, you figure, figure out which parts need to be developed. You work on those. and. When the parts are developed, you try to maintain them. Developing and maintaining are two different things. Like the difference between getting on your bicycle and getting up and getting started, and then maintaining your balance as you ride along. It's a different set of skills. So these are things you have to keep in mind, simply trying to figure out what's the right effort right now. And you know that the effort is right when it gives rise to a sense of rapture, a sense of fullness inside. You feel refreshed, energized. So those are the qualities you want to develop when you feel that you sense that your mind is too sluggish. If your energy is too scattered, you want to develop qualities more of serenity, concentration, equanimity. The one thing the Buddha has you develop at all times is mindfulness. But mindfulness is not simply awareness of the present moment. It means keeping in mind what you need to know. So mindfulness is not simple. You have to keep these instructions in mind. It doesn't mean that you keep repeating them to yourself all the time. But it does mean you want to have them in the back of the mind to direct your attention as you're trying to stay with the breath and you see that your balance isn't too good, you're falling off the bike to the left or you're falling off to the right, how do you get back on, get in, back into balance? And notice that balance is not a static thing. If you ever watched a person walking across a tightrope, there's a fair amount of back and forth, back and forth. but. The real skill there is when you sense that you're going a little bit too far to the right, you know how to correct. Going too far to the left, you know how to correct for it. That's when you really exercise your discernment. So although you have to bring some discernment to the path to begin with, the path requires that you exercise it and develop it. That means taking responsibility for looking after your state of concentration and figuring out, is it something that needs to be given a little more energy? Are there things coming in that you have to abandon? Make sure that you don't go running off after them. Is your energy level beginning to, to fade? How do you bring it back up? And when things are going well, how do you simply maintain them? And even when you do get a good, well-balanced state of concentration, how long do you maintain it just as it is before you start asking questions about it? Because you find that as you practice, the issue is not so much what level of concentration you reached. The issue is what do you do with what concentration you have. And it turns out the instructions are always the same. They get more subtle. The basic instruction is learn how to maintain this 
in as many different situations as you can. And as it gets more and more solid, then you can start asking, to what extent is there still some instability in this? Is any rise or level, rise or fall in the level of stress? And for that, you have to be very quiet, but very alert. Lumpu Kamdi, one of the great Tanajans, said you have to be like a hunter. You go to the spot where you know the animals that you want tend to go. But you can't know for sure when they're going to come. You can't make an appointment. You get there and you have to be very still but very alert. Still so that you don't scare the animals off, but very alert so you can sense the slightest sounds they might make. And it's the same with your concentration. You try to make it as still as possible and then be alert to any unstillness. So things get more and more solid. You don't throw the concentration away so that you can then move on to vipassana. The clear seeing, which is what genuine, genuine vipassana is all about, comes from trying to be very, very skilled in keeping the mind still and developing more sensitivity to how it beco may become more still. What little things are you still doing that are knocking it off balance? But the answers to these questions, again, fall under the Four Noble Truths. What are the things that you want to comprehend? What are the things you want to abandon? What are the things you need to develop, and what are the things you simply want to realize? So there's no one, one size fits all kind of set of instructions. And given the fact that the mind is so complex, it's very doubtful that any instruction to simply give you one set of basic instructions of what to do all the time throughout the meditation would actually work. Instructions of that sort would be like the cannons that they set into concrete in Singapore before World War II. They thought the Japanese were going to come from the sea, so they pointed the cannons out to the sea and they set them in concrete. And it turned out the Japanese came down the Malay, Malay Peninsula. The cannons were useless. In other words, your defilements, once they see you doing one thing, will find some other thing, some other angle to attack you from. You want to be all around. And how you look after your concentration and how you understand what might need to be done. There's lots of things can come up. The fact that the Buddha boiled things down to Four Noble Truths, that's quite a huge simplification right there. But simply knowing which of the Four Truths applies to which of your thoughts, which mental events, that requires a lot of discernment. And you have to be willing to make mistakes, notice that you made a mistake, and learn from it, and figure out how not to make that mistake again. It's that kind of practical discernment that you're after here. And the broader your comprehension of what's going on, and the broader your sense of the tools you have at your disposal, the more you'll be able to stay on course. <laughs>